Hello, and welcome to Peter Presents Iliad, Episode 5. I am really excited about this episode. Uh, when we last left our heroes, a battle had begun outside the walls of Troy between the Achaeans, the Greeks, and, of course, the Trojans. And everybody's there. Menelaus, Agamemnon, uh, Hector, um, Sarpedon, Glaucus. We've got uh, Diomedes, of course, Odysseus. But... <sighs> As a reminder, Achilles and his Myrmidons, the special forces, are sitting out because he's still angry with Agamemnon. Now, um, I'm going to get right into the story. Um, let's see, a little bit more of a recap. Uh, the battle had started going up again because uh, Pandarus, it's important you remember that guy, had shot an arrow with a special sort of sniper rifle type bow, and it just barely nicked Menelaus with it now uh it's kind of a funny character thing where agamemnon starts like crying over his brother but his entire speech he's talking about himself he's like oh no this is gonna be so bad for me oh you're hurt and then i'm gonna have to do this and stuff it's like yeah make it about you agamemnon of course you do but anyway just a nice little character moment there so i've got this frame here for you um i should probably update this thing <laughs> but it's uh it'll, it'll be helpful um, anyway, for those of you having trouble with the thing, uh, keeping track of names. So, uh, I hope you have something nice to drink, uh, with you. Let me put that there for now. And I'm gonna move my mic a little bit. Hopefully that's good. Alright. Once again, thank you so much for joining me for this. So, uh, with that, let's get on with Iliad Book 5. Uh, All right. <clears throat> okay. Let's get into it. Now remember the plain, the sand, the dust, chariot, spears, polished bronze. All right. So here we go. Iliad 5. Pallas Athena now gave to Diomedes, Tydeus' son, the strength and and courage that would make him shine among the Greeks and win him glory. Starlight flowed from his helmet and shield, as if Sirius had just risen from the sea before dawn in autumn, and that brightest of stars was blazing from his torso and face instead of from the sky. Athena aimed him to where the battle was thickest. There was a Trojan named Dares, a rich man without a blemish on him, and a priest of Hephaestus. He had two sons, Phegeus and Idaeus, trained warriors. These two now separated themselves from the crowd and went for Diomedes, they in their chariot, he on foot. When they closed, Phegeus threw. His spear sailed high, passing well over the left shoulder of Diomedes, who kept on coming, launching a shot that hit Phegeus' betw chest between his nipples and knocked him from his rig. Idaeus jumped for it, abandoning his chariot and his slain brother, whose prostrate corpse he did not have the courage to defend. He himself would not have escaped black death if Hephaestus had not got him out of there, wrapping him in night, so that the old man, his priest, would not be utterly bereaved. Diomedes did get the horses, though, and had his men drive them back to the ships. When the Trojans saw Dare's two sons, one in flight, the other dead by his chariot, their hearts shriveled. Athena's cold gray eyes bored in on Ares. She took his hand and said, Ares, you bloodthirsty marauder, why don't we let the Greeks and Trojans fight to see to which side Father Zeus gives glory? We'd both best withdraw and avoid his anger. And with that, she led Ares away from the battle and made him sit on the Scamander's sandy banks, 
while the Greeks pushed the Trojans back. Each leader took out his man. First, the warlord Agamemnon knocked Odius, the Halizones commander, out of his chariot as he led the retreat, planting a spear between his shoulder blades and driving it out through his chest. He fell with a thud, and his armor clanged on his body. Idomeneus killed Phaestus, the Maeonian, who had come from Tarne's black soil, threading his spear through his right shoulder as he tried to mount his chariot, but instead fell back from it into the loathsome dark. Idomeneus' squires stripped off his armor. Menelaus killed Scamandrius. This man had been taught to hunt by Artemis herself and could shoot any animal the mountain forest nourished. But neither the goddess nor all his old skill in archery could help him now. Menelaus planted a spear between his shoulder blades and drove it out through his chest. He fell with a thud, and his armor clanged on his body. Meriones killed Phericleus, whose father was Tecton and grandfather Harmon, and who was himself a skilled craftsman, for Pallas Athena loved him prodigiously. He could build all sorts of intricate things, and had built for Paris the doomed holes that first spelled evil for Troy and for himself, since he had no inkling of the gods' oracles. Meriones ran him down from behind and hit him in the right buttock. The spear point slid beneath the bone clear through the bladder. He fell to his knees and groaned as death took him. Meges took out Padaeus, Antenor's son. Though he was a bastard, Theano raised him as one of her own to please her husband. Now Meges got close enough to him to send his spear through the tendon at the back of his neck and on into his mouth, cutting away the tongue at its root. He fell into the dust, his teeth clenched on cold bronze. Eurypylus got Hepsinor, son of Delopion, an honored priest of the river Scamander. Euaemon's glorious son Eurypylus caught up with him as he sprinted away and without breaking stride slashed at the man's shoulder with his sword and lopped off his arm, which fell in a bloody mass to the ground. Death covered his eyes with a purple haze. This was their labor in the crush of battle. As for Diomedes, you could not tell which side he belonged to, Greek or Trojan, as he boiled across the plain. A winter torrent will sweep away the thickest riprap meant to contain it, and flood over also the vineyard walls when the rain of Zeus makes its swollen waters suddenly rise and obliterate many fine human works. So too, Tidius' son were, dr son were driven thick Trojan battalions. Many as they were, they could not withstand this single human tide. When Pandarus saw him storming across the plain and driving entire battalions before him, he bent his curved bow and, taking aim at Diomedes, hit him on the fly in his right shoulder. The arrow pierced the corslet plate and spattered it with blood as it punched through, and Pandarus whooped. Got him! Take heart, Trojan horseman! The best of the Achaeans has hit! I don't think he will hold up long under that stiff shaft if Apollo's truths sent me forth from Lycia. Half prayer, half boast, but the arrow didn't kill him. Diomedes took cover next to his horses and car, and still standing, said to Thnenelus, his driver, Snuff Capanius, get down from the car and pull this arrow out of my shoulder! Thnenelus vaulted down to the ground, steadied himself, and drew the arrow clean through his shoulder and out the other side, blood spurting through the linked tunic, and Diomedes 
good at the war shout, prayed. Hear me, daughter of Zeus, if ever you stood by my father's side, a friend in the heat of battle, stand by me now, goddess Athena. Deliver unto me and place within the range of my spear the man who hit me before I saw him and boasted I would not see for long the brilliant light of Helios the sun. Pallas Athena heard Diomedes' prayer. She made his body lithe and light, then feathered these words into his ear. Go after the Trojans for all your worth, Diomedes. I have put in your heart your father's heroic temper, the fearless fighting spirit of Tidius the horseman, Tidius the shield. And I have removed the mist that has clouded your eyes, so that now you can tell God from man. Do not fight with any immortal who might come and challenge you. Except Aphrodite, daughter of Zeus. If she comes, you may wound her with bronze. With these words, the gray-eyed one was gone, and Diomedes returned to the front. He had been eager before to fight the Trojans, but now his fury was tripled. A shepherd wounds a lion as he leaps a pen's wall, but far from being weakened, the lion gains in strength, and the unprotected flock is little more than a pile of bloody fleece before the angered lion leaps out again. So too Diomedes among the Trojans, killing next Astinius and Hyperion, one with a spear cast above his nipple, the other with a sword stroke to the collarbone, shearing off the entire shoulder from the neck and back. He let them lie, and went after Abbas and Polydius, son of Eurydamus, who read dreams, but read no dreams for them when they left home. Diomedes cut them down and moved on, there were two more brothers, Xanthus and Thoon, sons of Thanops, who loved them well. He was worn out with old age and its miseries, and had no other son to be his heir. Diomedes killed them too, taking their lives and leaving for the father sorrow and grief. They would not live to be welcomed home, and others would divide their inheritance. His next victims were two sons of Priam, Echemon and Chromius, in one chariot. Diomedes jumped on them as a lion leaps on a heifer's grazing peacefully in a woodland pasture and breaks her neck. It was a brutal dismount the son of Tidius forced them to make. He then stripped their armor and his men drove their horses back to the ships. Aeneas saw him wrecking the Trojan ranks and made his way through the busy spears searching for Pandarus. When he found him, looking like the match for a god that he was, he went up to him and had this to say, Pandarus, where are your arrows and bow and your fame? No one here in all Lycia can compete with you or claim to be better. Say a prayer to Zeus and take a shot at this man, whoever he is, who is beating the daylights out of the Trojans, some of our best, too. It could be he's a god, angry with the Trojans over some sacrifice. That would be tough. Lycian's splendid son came back with this. Aeneas, he looks like Diomedes to me. His shield, his grooved helmet, his horses... I'm not at all sure that he's not a god, but if he is who I think he is, Tidius' son, he's not fighting like this without some god standing at his side and cloaked in mist. I swear one of the immortals turned aside an arrow I already shot at him, just as it struck. I wound up hitting him in the right shoulder, clean through his breastplate. I thought I had sent him down to Hades, but I didn't get him. Some god is sure angry. Anyway, I don't have a chariot now, or horses to pull it. Not that there, there aren't eleven beautiful new chariots back in Lycian's palace, covered with cloths and a yoke of horses, beside each one eating white barley and spelt. 
Yes, and Lycion, the old spearman, told me as I left to go to war mounted, advice I should have taken, but I didn't. Sparing the horses because I was afraid that in an army this big they would lack feed, and they had been used to eating all they wanted. So I left them and came to Ilion on foot, trusting my bow. For all the good it has done, I've taken shots at two of their best, Diomedes and Menelaus, and hit them both, drew blood for sure, and only made them matter. Curse the day I took my bow from its peg and led my Trojan troops to lovely Ilion. As a favor to Hector, if I ever return and see my land, my wife, and my high-roofed home, may my throat be cut by a thief in the night if I fail to smash my bow into pieces and throw it on the fire. It's been a piece of junk. And Aeneas, the Trojan commander, replied, Don't talk like that. Things won't get any better until you and I take a chariot and face him in combat. Come on, get in mind, and you'll see what the horses of Tros can do. They know how to eat up the plain and how to cut and turn in pursuit or flight, and they will get us back to the city in safety if Zeus gives Diomedes the glory again. Get in, and take the lash and the reins, and I'll dismount to fight. Or you, take him on, and leave the horses to me. Lycaon's splendid son came back with this. Keep the reins, Aeneas, and drive your own horses. They will pull better for a driver they know, in case they have to run from the son of Tidius. I wouldn't want them to be spooked and shy from pulling us out because they miss your voice. Not with Diomedes all over us. He'd kill us both and make off with your horses. No, you drive them, and I'll meet his charge with my spear. So they mounted the chariot and drove off full speed ahead toward the son of Tidius. Stenelus saw them coming and said to Diomedes, Here comes a duo now with muscle to spare and hot to fight you. One is good with a bow, Pandarus. Nobosi is like Haean's son. The other is Aeneas, who says his mother is Aphrodite and Anchises, his father. Let's retreat in the chariot. Calm down and get out of the action or you'll get yourself killed. Diomedes looked him up and down and said, Don't talk to me about retreating, Snenelus. It's not to me to dodge a fight. Besides, I still have my strength. I'm not even going to get in the chariot, much less retreating it. I'll take them on just like this. Pallas Athena won't let me back down. As for these two, their horses won't be carrying them both away, even if one of them manages to escape. And one thing more, Athena has many plans, but if she does give me the glory here, and I kill them both, hold our horses on this spot. Tying the reins to the chariot rail, and rush Aeneas' horses, drive them back away from the Trojans and to the Greek lines. These horses come from the stock of Zeus, gave to Tros as payment for his son Ganymede, the finest horses under the sun. And Caesar stole some of the breed from Lemedon by secretly putting his merits to them, and so got six colts born in his own palace. Four he kept for himself, and reared at the stall, and two he gave to Aeneas, superb war horses. If we could take these... It'd be a real coup. Thus, Diomedes and his driver, their two opponents, drove their thoroughbreds hard and quickly closed the gap, and Pandarus, Lycian's splendid son, called out, You're tough, Diomedes, a real pedigreed hero, so I only stung you with that arrow. Well, let's see what I can do with the spear! The shaft cast a long shadow as it left his hand and hit Diomedes' shield. The bronze apex sheared through the stopped, sheared through and stopped just short of his breastplate. Pandarus, thinking he had hit him, whooped again. Got you right through the belly, didn't I? You're done for, and you've handed me the glory. Diomedes answered him levelly. You didn't even come close. But I swear one of you two goes down now and gluts Ares with his blood. 
His javelin followed his voice, and Athena guided it to where the nose joins the eye socket. The bronze crunched through the pearly teeth and sheared the tongue at its root, exiting at the base of the chin. Pandarus fell from the car, his armor scattering the hard light as it clattered on his fallen body. His horses shied, quick movement of hooves as his soul seeped out into the sand. Aeneas vaulted down with his shield and spear, afraid that the Greeks might drag the body away. He straddled it like a lion, sure of its strength. Spear straight out, crouched behind his shield's disc, only too glad to kill whoever stood up to him. His mouth open in a battle howl, but Tidius' son levered up in one hand a slab of stone much too large for two men to lift, as men are now, lifted it and smashed it into Aeneas's hip, where the thigh bone turns in the socket that medics call the cup. The rough stone shattered this joint and severed both tendons, ripping open the skin. The hero sank to his knees, clenching the dirt with one hand, while midnight settled upon both his eyes. That would have been the end of Aeneas, but his mother, Aphrodite, Zeus's daughter, who bore Aeneas to Anchises the oxherd, had all this in sharp focus. Her milk-white arms circled around him, and she enfolded him in her radiant robe to prevent the Greeks from killing him with a spear to the chest. As she was carrying him out of battle, Snenelus remembered the instructions Diomedes had given him. He held his own horses away from the boiling dust, tying the reins to the chariot rail, and on foot stampeded Aeneas's beautiful horses toward the Greek lines, giving them to Deipolis, the boyhood friend he valued most and whose mind was like his, to drive back to the ships. Then he mounted his own chariot, took the glossy reins in hand, and drove his heavy-hooved horses off to find Tidius' son, who was himself in armed pursuit of Aphrodite. Diomedes knew this was a weakling goddess, not one of those who control human warfare. No Athena, no Enyo here, who demolishes cities. And when he caught up to her in the melee, he pounced at her with his spear, and thrusting, nicked her on her delicate wrist, the blade piercing her skin through the ambrosial robe that the graces themselves had made for her. The cut was just above the palm, and the goddess immortal blood oozed out. Or rather, the ichor that flows in the blessed god's veins, who, eating no bread and drinking no wine, are bloodless, and therefore deathless as well. The goddess shrieked and let her son fall, and Phoebus Apollo gathered him up in an indigo cloud to keep the Greeks from killing him with a spear to the chest. And Diomedes yelling above the battle noises, Get out to the war, daughter of Zeus! Don't you have enough to do distracting weak women? Keep meddling in war and you'll learn to shiver when it's even mentioned! The goddess, in extreme distress now, went off in a daze. Wind-footed Iris took her and led her through the throng, throbbing with pain, her pale skin bruised. After a while, she found Ares, sitting on the left of the battle, his spear propped against a bank of mist, his horses standing by. Aphrodite fell to her knees and begged her brother for his gold-frontleted horses. Brother dear, lend me your horses and help me get to Olympus. I'm hurt, wounded by a mortal, Diomedes, who would fight even Father Zeus. Ares gave her the gold frontleted horses. She mounted the chariot gingerly, and Iris stepped in and took the reins. She cracked the whip, and the team flew off and came in no time to steep Olympus, the god's homestead. Iris, a blur of windy light, halted the team, unyoked them, 
and cast before them their ambrosial fodder. Aphrodite went into her mother, Dione, and fell in her lap, and Dione, cradling her daughter in her arms and stroking her with her hands, said, Oh, my poor baby, who did this to you? To treat you like this, what did you do? And Aphrodite, the goddess who loved to smile, Tidia's son wounded me, that bully Diomedes, because I was carrying my son out of range, and Neith, who is my dearest. The war has gone far beyond Trojans and Greeks. The Greeks are fighting the immortal gods. Dione answered in her lustrous voice, You must bear it, my child. I know it hurts. Many of us Olympians have suffered harm from men, giving tit for tat to each other. Ares did when Otis and Ephialtes, those bullies, son of, sons of Ulius, kept in tied him up in a bronze jar for thirteen months. They would have destroyed the god of war if their stepmother, beautiful Erobie, hadn't told Hermes. He got Ares out, but the painful bonds had about done him in. Hera suffered too when Heracles shot her right in the breast with a triple-pronged arrow, and there was no helping the pain she had then. Hades, too, formidable as he is, had to endure an arrow the same man shot him with among the dead in Pylos, making him suffer. He went to the house of Zeus on Olympus in agony, pierced with pain. The arrow had driven right through his shoulder. Paeon rubbed on an anodyne and healed him. Hades being no mortal. Heracles was simply outrageous and reckless to provoke the Olympian gods with arrows. And now Athena has set this man upon you, this fool Diomedes who doesn't understand that a man who fights with gods doesn't last long. His children don't sit on his lap, calling him Papa, to welcome him home from the horrors of war. So as strong as he is, he had better watch out or someone braver than you might fight him. And Agalia, Andrastus' heroic daughter, the wife of Diomedes, tamer of horses, will wake her family from sleep with lamenting her wedded husband, the best of the Achaeans. And with both her hands, she wiped off the ichor, the wrist was healed, and the pain subsided. Athena and Hera were looking on and making snide remarks to provoke Zeus, the, the gray-eyed goddess, open with this. You won't get angry if I say something, will you, Father Zeus? The truth is this. Aphrodite has been urging some Greek lady to traipse over her beloved Trojans, and while she was stroking this gowned beauty, she scratched her frail little hand on a golden brooch. The father of gods and men smiled, and calling Aphrodite, said to her, Dear child, war isn't your specialty, you know. You just take care of the pleasures of love and leave the fighting to Ares and Athena. <laughs> While these gods were talking to each other, Diomedes leapt upon Aeneas, even though he knew Apollo's hands were there above him. Great as Apollo was, Diomedes meant to kill the Trojan and strip off his armor. Three times he leapt in homicidal frenzy. Three times Apollo flicked his lacquered shield. But when he charged a fourth last time, he heard a voice that seemed to come from everywhere at once and knew it was Apollo's voice, saying to him, Think it over, son of Tidius, and get back. Don't, let your, don't set your sights on the gods. Gods are to humans what humans are to crawling bugs. Even at this, Diomedes only backed up a little, just out of range of the wrathful god. And Apollo took Aeneas from the swarm up to his temple on sacred Pergamum. 
There Leto and arrowy Artemis healed him in the great sanctuary and made him glorious. And silver-bowed Apollo made a phantom to look like Aeneas, armor and all. And over this wraith, the Greeks and Trojans battered each other with their rawhide shields until the edges were tattered into leather fringe. Apollo then called out to the god of war, Ares, you bloodthirsty marauder, would you be so kind as to take this Diomedes out of action before he goes up against Zeus? He's already wounded Cyprus on the wrist and come after me like a raging demon. Apollo then sat down on Pergamum's height, while Ares went to spur on the Trojans, disguised as Acamas, the Thracian commander. He called out to the well-born sons of Priam, you sons of Priam, a king bred by Zeus, how long will you allow your men to be killed by the Achaean forces, perhaps until you are fighting right in front of our gates? Aeneas is down, son of noble Anchises, a man whom we honored as much as Hector. Let's save our comrade from the boiling dust. This caught their attention, and Sarpedon added his voice, scolding Hector sternly. Where has your will to fight gone, Hector? You used to say you could hold the city without any allies, just yourself, backed by your brothers and sisters' husbands. I don't see a single one of them now who's not cringing like a dog before a lion. The only ones fighting are us, the allies. I'm only an ally myself from a long way off. It's a long way to Lycia by eddying Xanthus, where I left my dear wife and baby boy and all my property and envied wealth. And yet I press my Lycians into battle and take on my man with nothing of mine here for the Achaeans to take or drive away. But you can't even be troubled to urge your men to take a stand and defend their own wives. Watch out you're not caught like flies in a web, an easy prey for your enemies who will waste your populous city. You should be worrying about this day and night and begging the captains of your gallant allies to hold their ground or take the heat yourself. Sarpedon's speech cut Hector to the quick. He leapt to the ground with all his gear, and brandishing a, p a pair of sharp spears, roamed the ranks, urging everyone to fight. The noise intensified, and with a roar, the Trojans whirled to face the Achaeans, who remained in tight formation and did not flinch. Wind carries chaff over the holy threshing floors when men are winnowing, and Demeter herself, blonde in the blowing wind, separates the grain from the chaff, and the piles of chaff that accumulate grow whiter and whiter. So too the Greeks under the cloud of white dust, their horses' hooves kicked up from the plain as the chariots wheeled into action again, and men locked up in hand-to-hand combat. The bronze sky paled. Ares, who was everywhere at once now, covered the battle with night to help the Trojans, honoring the request of Sun Gold Apollo, who had asked him to rouse the Trojan spirits when he saw that Athena, who supported the Greeks, had gone off. Apollo chose this moment to send forth Aeneas from his rich sanctuary, infused with strength. Aeneas took his place in the ranks. The men were glad to see him back to join them, alive and well, and in good fighting form, but they did not have time to question him. Busy as they were with what Apollo was doing with the help of Ares and ravenous strife. The Greeks were rallied by the two Ajaxes, along with Odysseus and Diomedes. Not that they quailed before the Trojan attack. In still weather, when the winds that usually scatter the shadowy clouds are asleep, huge banks of mist lie absolutely steady, where Zeus has set them on the mountain tops. The Greeks met the Trojans without a tremor. Agamemnon ranged among them, commanding, Be men, my friends, fight with valor, and with a sense of shame before your comrades, you're less likely to be killed with a sense of shame, running away never won glory or a fight. 
and with a quick throw of his spear, he hit one of Aeneas's men, Diocoon, son of Pergasus, whom the Trojans respected as much as Priam's sons, quick as he was to fight in the front lines. Agamemnon's spear hit his shield, which did not stop the bronze point from penetrating all the way through and into his belly, below his belt. He fell with a thud, and his armor clanged. When Aeneas killed two of Greece's best, Crethon and Orsilochus, the sons of Diocles, a man of substance who lived in Pherae and was descended from the river Alpheus, whose broad streams flow through the Pilian's land, and who begot Ortilochus to rule over many. This Ortilochus was the father of Diocles, who had twin sons, Crethon and Orsilochus. Highly trained warriors, they had just reached manhood when they went with the Argives on the black ships to Ilion, famed for its horses, to win recompense for the sons of Atreus, but death and folded them both in that land. Two cubs, a mother lion has reared in the mountains, where the woods are thick, will begin snatching cattle and sheep from human settlements and continue ravaging the flocks for years until humans finally hunt them down. So these two brothers beaten to the ground by Aeneas. They fell like tall fir trees, and as they fell, Menelaus pitied them. He strode through the foremost fighters, gleaming in his bronze and shaking two spears, spurred on by Ares, whose intention was that Menelaus go down at Aeneas' hands. But Antilochus, Nestor's son, saw him and strode through the front lines, afraid that if anything happened to Menelaus, the Greeks would be robbed of all their hard work. The two had just squared off, their spears pointed directly at each other, when Antilochus took his place right next to Menelaus. Aeneas, quick as he was in battle, did not stay around when he saw the two of them standing their ground together. They pulled the dead brothers back to the Achaean lines and put them in their comrades' arms, then returned to fight in the foremost ranks. Working as a team, they killed Polymenes, the great Paphlagonian commander, and Maidon, his charioteer. Menelaus put his spear through Polymenes' collarbone as he stood stock still. His squire, Maidon, was trying to turn the horses when Antilochus hit him with a stone on the elbow. The reins, white with ivory, fell from his hands to the ground, and Antilochus jumped him, driving his sword through his temple. He gasped and pitched forward, landing headfirst in the soft, deep sand, where he stuck up to his shoulders, feet upright, and held that position for some time until his horses knocked him over with their hooves. Antilochus drove them back toward the camp. Hector saw all this from across the ranks and charged them with a shout. Trojans poured after him in force, led by Ares and Enyo in her power, who held in her hands the deafening, shameless horror of war. Ares cradled an enormous spear in his hands and fell in with Hector, moving ahead of him, or a pace or two behind. <laughs> Diomedes stopped dead in his tracks when he saw him. A man crossing the Great Plains comes to a river, and is so startled when he sees the water churning to the sea that he takes a step backward. So Diomedes gave ground and said to his men, Well, my friends, we always thought Hector was a good man with a spear and a real fighter. It turns out, a god is always at his side. Ares, right now, disguised as a mortal. Keep your face toward the enemy and back up. Steadily, don't be too eager to fight with gods. <laughs> Thus Diomedes and the Trojans closed in. Hector killed two men, good fighters, Menestheus and Ancilius, riding together. As they fell, Big Ajax pitied them and came to stand close by, 
he threw his shining spear and hit Amphius, son of Selagus, a man from Pasus, who had rich farms there. But fate led him to come to the aid of Priam and his sons. Ajax's tree of a spear hit him in the belly, going right through the belt. He fell heavily, and Ajax rushed up to strip his armor, but was met with a hail of Trojan missiles gleaming in the air, many of which he collected on his shield. Still, Big Ajax planted his heel upon the corpse and pulled out his bronze spear. He was not able, though, to get the armor unstrapped, pressed as he was by the spears and fearing a pincer movement by the numerous and now confident Trojans. Big as Ajax was, they pushed him back, and he staggered as he gave ground. While these struggles were going on, fate aroused Telepolemus, son of Hercules, tall and handsome, to go up against godlike Sarpedon. When these two were in range of each other, son and grandson of Zeus in the clouds, it was Telepolemus, Telepolemus, who was first to speak. Well, well, Sarpedon, the Lycian. How are you doing skulking around here? You wouldn't know what to do in a fight. They lie when they say you're on a son they lie when they say you're a son of Zeus. You don't even come close to the heroes who were born from Zeus in the old days. Like my father, lion hearted Heracles, who came here once for Lamedon's mares, with only six ships and a few men, but sacked Troy and emptied her streets. You have a coward's heart, and your race is dying. Your coming from Lycia is not going to help the men of Troy. I don't care how strong you are, you're going through Hades' gates, beaten by me. And Sarpedon, the Lycian commander, Telepolemus, your father sacked Ilion because Lamedon was foolish enough to deride the man who had helped him and withheld the horses he had come so far to get. As for you, I'm going to work out a bloody death for you. You're going to give glory to me and your soul to Hades. Sarpedon spoke, and Telepolemus lifted his ashwood spear. They both cast at once, and the spears crossed in flight. Sarpedon's hit Telepolemus's full in, Telepolemus full in the neck. The point passed completely and painfully through, and Ebony Knight enfolded his eyes. Telepolemus' spear hit Sarpedon's left thigh. The point slashed through with a vengeance and grazed the bone. But his father saved him, for now. Sarpedon's men carried him out of battle, the long spear trailing heavily. In their haste, no one noticed it or thought to draw it out, which would have allowed him to use his legs. It was difficult work tending him at all. On the other side, the Greeks bore Tlepolemus away from the fighting. Odysseus saw all this and longed for action. He debated inwardly whether he would pursue the son of thundering Zeus or take instead many Lycian lives. It was not Odysseus's fate to kill Sarpedon, so Athena focused his mind on the Lycians. He killed Charinus, Alastor, and Chromius, Alcandrus, Helius, Noemon, and Prytanus. And he would have killed more. But Hector was quick to see what was going on and strode through the foremost fighters, helmet shining above his flaming bronze, bringing terror to the Greeks and joy to Sarpedon, who groaned as he spoke, Son of Priam, don't let me lie here as pray for the Greeks. Help me. If I must die, let me die in your city, since I will never return to my own land to make glad my wife and infant son. Hector did not waste any time answering but sprinted past, helmet glancing in light in his passion to drive the Argives back and kill as many of them as he could. And godlike Sarpedon was made to sit beneath the beautiful oak, sacred to Zeus, and Pelagon, his comrade, pulled the spear out of his thigh. His spirit left him, and a mist poured down over his eyes. Then the north wind blew upon him, and he breathed again, 
though he had gasped out his soul. Under pressure from Ares and Hector, the Greeks neither turned and made for their ships nor held their own in the fight, but eased themselves backward now that they knew the Trojans had Ares. The killing began with certain Greeks distinguished as Hector's and Ares' victims, godlike Teuthras, Orestes, a horse driver, Unomius, Antrichus, Aetolian spearman, Helenus, son of Enops, and Arispius, a prosperous Boeotian with a gilded corslet. The havoc continued, and when Hera noticed that the Greeks were being crushed in battle, her words flew fast to Pallas Athena. This is a disaster, daughter of Zeus. Our words to Menelaus that he would go home with Troy demolished will come to nothing if we allow Ares to rage on like this. Come, it's time we remembered how to fight. Athena, the gray-eyed goddess, agreed. And Hera, queen of heaven, daughter of Cronus, got busy harnessing the horses, gold frontleted, while Hebe slid the bronze, eight-spoked wheels onto the car's iron axle, wheels with pure gold rims fitted with bronze tires, a stunning sight. And the hubs spinning on both sides were silver. The car's body was made of gold, and silver straps stretched tight and had a double railing. From, its projected a, from it projected a silver pole, and at its end he be bound the golden yoke, and on that she hung the golden harness. Hera led the quick-hooved horses beneath the yoke, her, ho- her heart pounding for war. Athena, meanwhile, Zeus's favorite daughter, let her supple robe slip down to her father's floor. This embroidered garment her own handiwork. She put on one of Cloudy Zeus's tunics and strapped on her armor. Around her shoulders she flung the tasseled aegis, bordered with rout and inset with the blood-chilling horrors of war, in the center of which was a gorgon's head, the dread insignia of Zeus' aegis holder. On her head she put a gold helmet, knobbed and horned, and embossed with a hundred cities' soldiery. She stepped into the blazing chariot, cradling a spear long and thick enough for heaven's daughter to level battalions of heroes in her wrath. Hera quickly flicked the horses with the lash, and the automatic gates of heaven groaned open as willed by the hours who control access to Olympus and heaven, opening and shutting the dense cloud banks. Through this gate, they drove the patient horses and found Zeus sitting apart from the other gods on the highest peak of ridged Olympus. White-armed Hera reined in the horses there and put her questions to the Most High. Father Zeus... Doesn't Ares infuriate you with his reckless destruction of so many Greeks? Much to my sorrow, while Cyprus and Apollo, smug at their success, are lounging around with this mindless bully who knows no law? Father Zeus, will you be angry with me if I knock Ares silly and out of the battle? And Zeus, clouds scuttling around him. Better put Athena onto him. She's always been the best at giving him grief. White-armed Hera did not disobey. She lashed the horses and they flew with a will between the starry heavens and earth. One bound of the gods' horses takes them as far into the misty distance as a lookout can see over the wine-blue Aegean. When they came to Troy, and to the confluence of the Scamander and Simois River. The white-armed goddess reigned in the horses, unyoked them, and shed a thick mist around them. Simois made ambrosia sprout up for them. The two goddesses, though passionate to come to the aid of the Greeks, stepped forward as quietly as doves. They were soon in the thick of things, where the army's elite, drawn to Diomedes' strength, clustered around him like huge animals, lions, or razorback hogs that can rip a man apart. 
Hera took her stance there and transformed herself to look like Stentor, whose bronze voice sounds as loud as 50 voices combined, and she yelled, For shame, Greeks! You're all show and no fight! When godlike Achilles used to enter battle, the Trojans wouldn't so much as leave their gates out of fear for what his spear could do. Now they have us backed up against our ships! This got their fighting spirit up. Meanwhile, gray-eyed Athena flashed to Diomedes' side. She found that prince beside his horses and car, cooling the wound from Pandarus' arrow. The sweat where his broad shield strap rubbed was bothering him, and his arm was sore. He was lifting the strap and wiping off the dark, clotted blood when the goddess, casually grasping the horse's yoke, said to him, you're not very much like your father, you know. Tidius had a small build, but he was a fighter, even when I wouldn't allow him to fight or show his stuff. Like the time he came to Thebes as a solo envoy to all those Cadmians, I ordered him to keep his peace at the banquet. But he had a lot of heart, as he always had, and challenged the Cadmian youths and beat them all effortlessly. Of course, I was there beside him. But you, I stand by you, I protect you. I tell you not to worry, to fight the Trojans. And here you are, either bone-tired or paralyzed with fear. No, you're no son of Tidius, or grandson of sharp old Aeneas. And Diomedes, as tough as they come, answered, I know it's you, goddess daughter of Zeus, and so I will answer you frankly. No, I'm not paralyzed with fear, and I'm not slack enough, but I am following the orders you gave me when you told me not to fight face to face with any of the gods except Aphrodite. If she came, you said I could wound her with bronze. That's why I've withdrawn and given orders for all the troops to fall back to this spot. I know that Ares is controlling the battle. And Athena whose eyes were as gray as owls. Diomedes, son of Tidius, I do love you. So don't, you don't have to fear Ares or any other of the immortals. Look who is here beside you. Drive your horses directly at Ares, and when you're in range, strike. Don't be in awe of Ares. He's nothing but a shifty lout. He promised Hera and me he would fight against Troy and help the Greeks. Now, he's turned Trojan and abandoned us. With that, she pulled Snanalus back and pushed him off the chariot. Snanalus went flying, and Athena got in next to Diomedes, who seemed to glow beside the eager goddess and the solid oak axle groaned under the load of an awesome deity and a hero at his best. Pallas Athena handled the reins and whip and drove the horses directly at Ares, who at that moment was stripping the armor from a warrior named Perithas, a huge man, Aetolia's finest and his father's glory. Ares was busy removing the dead man's armor and getting smeared with blood. Athena put on Hades' helmet, so Ares could not see her. But Ares did see Diomedes, and when he did, he dropped Periphus to lie in his own gore and headed straight for the hero. As soon as they were in range of each other, Ares leaned out over his horse's backs and thrust frantic for a kill. Athena's hand deflected the spear in midair and sent it sailing harmlessly over Diomedes' chariot. And when Diomedes thrust next, she drove his spear home to the pit of Ares' belly, where the kilt piece covered it. 
The spear had sliced right through the flesh, and when Diomedes pulled it out, Ares yelled so loud you would have thought 10,000 warriors had shouted at once, and the sound reverberated in the guts of the Greeks and Trojans, as if Diomedes had struck not a god in armor, but a bronze gong nine miles high. After a period of heat, when the low clouds are massed like wool, you will sometimes see a darker clot of air whirling off on its way to becoming a tornado. That is how Ares disappeared to Diomedes, moving off through the clouds and up the big sky. He quickly scaled the heights of Olympus, sat down sulking beside Cronian Zeus, showed him the immortal blood oozing from his wound, and whined these winged words. Father Zeus, doesn't it infuriate you to see this violence? We gods get the worst of it from each other whenever we try to help out men. Why did you have to give birth to that madwoman? Your marauding daughter who is always breaking the rules. All the rest of us gods, everyone on Olympus, listen to you. But she can say or do whatever she wants. You even urge her on, your gray-eyed girl. Just now she's been egging on Diomedes to rampage against the immortal gods. He wounded Cyprus first, got her on the wrist, then charged at me like an avenging spirit. My fast footwork saved me, or I would be lying in a heap of gruesome corpses, or barely alive for taking hits from his spear. And Zeus, from under Thunderhead brows, You shifty lout! Don't sit here by me and whine! You're the most loathsome god on Olympus. You actually like fighting and war. You take after your hard-headed mother, Hera. I can barely control her either. One way or another, she got you into this. But that as it may, I cannot tolerate your being in pain. Your mother did, after all, bear you to me. But if you were born to any other god, you'd be long buried in hell below the Titans. And he called to Paeon, the doc to doctor his wound. Paeon rubbed on an anodyne to kill the pain. And then, as quickly as white milk thickened with fig juice, curdles when stirred, Paeon healed Empetius Ares. And Hebe bathed him and dressed him handsomely. And he sat beside Zeus, exulting in glory. Then back to the palace of great Zeus came Argive Hera and Athena, the protector, having stopped brutal Ares from butchering men. And that is the end of book five. Woo! Okay. I love that one. Um, so, <laughs> oh my goodness. All right. Told you this had a lot of crazy action in it. Um, so yeah, just some things I find interesting about all this. Uh, well, first off, a little bit of a backtrack. Last week, I received a question from Bubba the Musician about the Ibex horn bow. And uh, if um, heating the horn in like water or something would be a way to make that bow work well i actually did look this up and so i don't know about ibexes and i don't know about you know 1200 bc and how they would do things but <laughs> when you're making a bow out of horn the way that uh people used to do that is well by people all right so in north america <laughs> so a totally different place but you know we got animals with horns and the natives here would actually make um bows out of horn uh I've, i'm not sure exactly which nation i believe more out west though so perhaps lakota don't quote me on that though and uh but anyway so a typical i suppose native horned bow the way that they would do that apparently was they would soak the horn 
in a hot spring. So you know how there's hot springs out by Yellowstone? Well, apparently those hot springs are or were uh, um, uh, sacred sites, and they would use that to soak the horns for their bows. And I actually found a video online of a guy who was um, doing this. Oops, sorry, I hit the mic. Um, doing this, who does this today, and he'll soak something in. He'll soak a horn in hot water for like three weeks. And uh, so what I was talking before with the wood and like how it might expand and how you use landseed oil, all that last episode. Well, apparently um, horn doesn't do the same thing that I thought, which I guess makes sense when you think about if you're washing dishes for a really long time and your fingernails get really soft, uh, that will be a way that uh, that's kind of what happens to horn. It's made out of the same stuff. So uh, apparently uh, that works. So thank you for that question, Bubba the Musician. I found out some cool stuff about that. I'll actually um, end up putting a link to that video in the description here. Um, but before I continue, I need to share something with y'all. Um, give me a second. Where is the bloody thing? Hmm. Huh, that's odd. Um, well, we'll get to that other thing in a moment um so anyway uh but carrying on um something that you'll notice in this uh thing is when someone is giving a message all right they will relay the message verbatim all right so uh if someone says go tell this person this when the person comes later to the person they're giving the message to they say it verbatim and even with stuff that maybe isn't that important to the message now that could be for a couple reasons one is because Iliad would be transferred orally like that's how people would say it and so repetition is easier to memorize <laughs> you know it's just a little less you have to do um, but also maybe because you know if you think about a time before email or like really um, writing things down quickly I suppose all that stuff messengers would have been very valuable and having a memory that you can repeat something verbatim would probably be very, very valuable so, because if you're getting a, a message from a king to another king, you better say exactly what that king said. Um, and it's possible that uh, that was part of your job as a messenger, of doing that verbatim. I find it hard to believe that that wouldn't be the case. Um, uh, so, yeah, now another weird thing is Homer uses a lot of imagery here, and he uses a lot of domestic scenes that are like... Um, you know, uh, cheese curdling or things that shepherds see or out in the wilderness or the star rising from the sea. And I find that interesting because we don't know a whole lot about Homer, all right? He was uh, supposed to be around in around 800 BC, and we know about him because people have talked about him. We don't have, like, evidence from when he's alive, when he was supposed to be alive that, like, he was alive or anything like that. Um, According to legend, Homer was blind, which I find very interesting. And when I was a kid, I always thought that made sense. Like, well, if you're blind, maybe you would work more on memorizing stuff. Like, I don't know. That just made sense to me when I was a kid. Um, but I think it's very likely that Homer was not... Um, uh, I find it very likely that Homer was not born blind. So if we say Homer was a real dude, and I, I think he was, um, it's very likely he was not born blind. You'll also see with some of these, the way that these uh, wounds are described, it's possible that he seems to have a little bit of medical knowledge, uh, perhaps, or anatomical knowledge. I'm just completely making stuff up here right now, but I think it's possible that Homer was basically a medic in um, in some war at some point. You know, maybe in the previous book when the one medic comes in and saves the guys, like walks into a circle of kings, maybe Homer did that one time. I don't know. I, it's something interesting to me. Um, <clears throat> Now, one of the things that I find most interesting about this book is that we really see um, that, like, Diomedes gets shot through the shoulder, right? And he just keeps going. 
Aphrodite gets like a little slit on the wrist and she can't hand- she drops her son <laughs> you know <laughs> and, um it's like wow what a wuss and then even the god of war when he gets hit like granted stomach hurts a lot especially when Athena's helping you stab the guy I love that we had two gods of war fight each other that's rad um but when <laughs> He goes up and he's just whining to Zeus, and Zeus is just Zeus is just like man up, <laughs> you know, I hate you. And he's like you let Athena do stuff. Shut up, son. <laughs> he's like, but I can't see you in pain because you are my son after all. But if you weren't, I would hate you even more than I do now. But while he's ta- while Zeus is reprim- reprimanding Ares, he says something very interesting you may have caught it at the end of the book there when he says you're the most loathsome god on olympus you actually like fighting and war hmm where have we heard something like that before back in book one agamemnon and achilles are fighting and he says to me you're the most hateful king under heaven you actually like fighting and war Hmm. That's interesting that Achilles, who is back at his little cottage that he his buddies have made him, is sulking out the battle, and um, Ares is sulking to Zeus, and they both get compared. I think there's interesting parallels there. Obviously, you might um, compare Achilles to Ares because they're both known for war and stuff. I love it when Hera and Z- Athena's like suit up so it's like she puts this car together like this chariot which imagine like putting a Lamborghini together that has that's made out of like silver gold and ivory or something it's like they're they're putting the Batmobile together or something and then um Athena gets in like her real battle gear we get some nudity there Ooh, I bet that was very exciting (laughs) back in the day um and she's wearing the Aegis, which I haven't really talked about much. The Aegis is a Greek artifact that people don't exactly know what it was. Um, it belonged to Zeus, and it had, like, a lot of mystical powers. It could, like, make things... It, it just was a magical device that um, sometimes you'll see a statue of Athena where it's like a shawl. And you'll see, like, she's got a gorgon's head here. Uh, That's what that is. Um, Now, I don't know that that's Medusa's head, though, because Athena carries Medusa's head on her shield. You know, Medusa, we'll we'll talk about Perseus sometimes, but yeah, all these stories are totally connected to each other. It's all connected. Um, You've got Athena, who helped Perseus um, uh, fight Medusa, and Medusa, if she, like, looked at you, you turned to stone, kind of like a basilisk, all right? And then... Um, eventually her head is given to Athena who puts it on her shield so her shield is like a weapon goddess of war wisdom and handicraft you know I like the detail where it says like oh she made this um, her this garment herself it's like yeah because she makes stuff she's really she's into handicraft there's also a lot of really violent um, bloodshed here like crunching of teeth with bronze spears and uh, that's nuts Um, but there's also these little tragedies where we hear about someone's dad and how sad their dad is going to be. It's like, when was the last time you were watching a movie where there was a battle scene and it cuts to, like, it, some soldier, you know, you know, you got soldier A here and he gets killed. And it's like, by the way, um, he has a dad and uh, two sons and he loves them a lot. And those two sons, now they're dead. And so the inheritance is going to be divided amongst other people his lines over it's like that doesn't (laughs) what is that um like the closest you get is when it's a joke like a really dark joke in something where a character dies and it's like some one-off stormtrooper and then it cuts to like their homie like oh no jerry's dead and that's supposed to be funny um but yeah lots of people die diomedes I don't know why not everybody... Diomedes deserves to be known as well as, like, Odysseus, Agamemnon, Achilles, and Hector. Yeah, he's, like... And and Ajax. Um, He's just... He's so awesome. Um, If you couldn't tell, there's a little bit of favoritism there from me. Uh, I also like that 
Athena lies to Ares. She's like, hey, Ares, let's come over. Like earlier on, she's like, hey, come away from the battle. Let's see what Zeus does. She sits him down, and then she sneaks off and gets involved in the battle again. Um, so, yeah, we got a lot of... Uh, we got a scene here with, like, you know, Hera, like, let's remember how to fight, and she and Athena go, and they argh, d destroy everything. It's great. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, most of the... Um, uh, analysis commentary I have for I I'm loving <laughs> this so much I am having so much fun and um, someone now a friend of mine asked me who uh, tunes into this live stream um, uh, he and I were talking the other day and he asked what does it mean when it refers to someone as godlike you know like a mortal as godlike and I said well actually in this next episode you're gonna see how some people mistake other people as gods and that happens with Diomedes and Sarpedon and um oh uh, blah, 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 what's his name um the guy with the bow starts with a p palace blah, blah, blah. anyway um he uh says like I'm not sure that guy's not a god he's like that guy might be a god or when the medic enters the circle of the heroes and enters like a god I think I I'm gonna look that up a little more uh because my assumption is just in the context it means like you're a boss you're a beast you're like you're you just oozing confidence you're on top of the world you know you're the goat that kind of thing um but i don't know if that has more of a reverent connotation to it and i would imagine it would but who knows um, all right, so I'm going to get to some questions now because I've got like, one more, two more other things to say, but I'm going to go into the chat. So let's see. Oh, we've got a good number of comments. Thank you very much. I'm very glad you all joined me for this. So we have Joe says, greetings, Peter, son of Patrick. Greetings, Joe, son of I'm not sure what your father's name is, but I'm sure he'd be very proud of you. Uh, we've got Bubba the Musician says, throwing five at us. Greek scum. All right, all right. So what that is, as I said, episode five. Okay, so I shouldn't be doing that. Uh, you got me, uh, because in Greece it turns out doing that at people is kind of the middle finger. Um, so it's like throwing five. So you, if you're driving at someone and you hate them, you go like yeah, like that. Um, so uh, I forgot. Oh well. Hey, it's close. Uh, you know, it's it's five o'clock somewhere, and it's May. So cinco. Um, okay, so. Oh, no. Uh, it looks like there's been a slight delay between the video and audio. Well, I'm very sad about that. Uh, oh, Garrett says the sync is fine on my end. That's all right. Okay. Well, hopefully it's going well. <laughs> I don't know. Just, just listen to it. Um, and, uh, okay, so seems like the sound's working for some people. Lorenzo says, absolutely entertaining. Glad I found some time for your reading of this fascinating chapter. Well, Lorenzo, I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. It's encouragement like that, which just, you know, puts a little bit more wind in my sails. And I'm trying to row along as it is, and I'm having a good time rowing this, rowing this little trireme, but it's always nice to get a little gust in there like that. So thank you very much. I'm glad you've enjoyed it. Um, Joe, once again, says, these shields are about as useful as Stormtrooper armor. Yes! Okay, so we can, uh, it looks like he's got another one, though. So why do they always want to strip the victim's armor after a kill? Perfect question, because that was the other thing I wanted to talk about. All right, so you'll notice Diomedes has a whole moment where he talks about um, someone else's horses. He's like, okay, if I if I get these two guys, you got to get their horses, then Ellis. And then um, people are always stripping armor and they're like risking their lives to do that. Okay, so here's how and why that worked. Though that was a, related to what we might call spoils of war. Okay, um, where on the one hand you would get that stuff, it was putting another feather in your cap, but there was actually something a little bit more uh, odd about it. Uh, well, well, with the horses, you would you horses were valuable. Like war horses are not normal horses, and they talk about that. But what that can mean is like a a well trained war horse. From what I understand, a well trained war horse will be able to ride on a battlefield, and will be able to like climb over bodies <laughs> and stuff. Like it's trained for that kind of thing without breaking its ankles all the time you know um it's it's used to warfare it won't get spooked by the sound and all that 
when it comes to the armor, it's bronze, as you know, which was also polished, which is very different from what in modern times we think armor should be like because we think of armor like, you know, soldiers were camouflage and you don't want to be seen. Well, on this battlefield, there's no real point to not being seen. In fact, you want to be seen. You want everyone to know like, hey, look, I'm fighting this guy and I just won. Look how cool I am. I'm, you know, it, there's status there. But when you loot a body of its armor, part of it's shaming the other side, which is one reason why your buddies will fight for your dead body. They will risk their lives so that they can't, you can't take him. You know, it might even be an advantage to them. It's like, hey, Ajax isn't fighting for a minute. He's looting a body, and they just swarm him, and they're like, no, he's ours. You can't have him. And that's part of that's just brotherhood in warfare. Um, there's a really moving interview of a American soldier who's talking about something like that, where he and a bunch of his battle brothers were fighting over, like, two dead bodies of his friends. All right, this is, like, more like Afghan war, I believe it was. And <clears throat> he's, they, they put so much fight and sacrifice into saving their bodies. And the interviewer, the journalist was saying like why would you do that <laughs> why why i mean they're dead though right like why i mean i guess it would be nice to have them back but why are you willing to fight that much to do that and the soldier was um clearly having a a, a difficult time finding words for it but then just said they're ours and i think that was about I think that if anyone could sum it up, that would probably be it. Um, so what else would they do with this armor, though? Would they use the armor themselves? Don't they have plenty of good armor of their own? Well, um, so as I, from what I have found, when you looted a body for its armor, you didn't actually use that armor. Think about it. It doesn't fit you either. So why would you... Bronze is not light. It's And it's also, by the way, shiny and will glint and perhaps like reflect onto people's eyes. Maybe that's part of it. It makes you all shiny and cool. But um, what they would do is they would take that back and they would dedicate the armor to temples. So um, we actually... This is, this is a very interesting little obscure part of... Um, Greek history where if you had a temple to Zeus or let's say Apollo let's say we got a temple to Apollo all right and you were f like fighting some other guys uh, let's say you're fighting the Lycians and you loot some of like some really important guys you know and you get their armor then you would take that and you would dedicate it to the temple it would be nailed up onto the wall but and so it's like an offering but here's the thing about that offering is that you would sign it it would have some kind of card or something etched into i believe like they would like etch onto the armor i think that's how we know this because we still have these um memory's a little fuzzy if like I, yeah i'm pretty sure they would like hammer it in and say like this armor was taken by so and so at when he was fighting the lycians all right and so what that did is it's like, oh, yes, I'm, I'm giving something to the gods. But you're also, that's a billboard for you. That's networking. Everybody's going to the temple, right? The temple is a very important place. And then your name's up there. It's like, oh, so-and-so, you know, oh, yes, I see, um, you know, Peter dedicated this wing of the uh, high school, you know. <laughs> that's kind of what it was. That kind of thing has been going on forever. And um, they would do that with armor. Now, here's the really funny thing. So you know it was totally, like, ulterior motives. I'm, I'm sure there were some people who were very devout and pious with it. But what would happen is, let's say I, ha I had gone into war and I t looted some armor off a of Lycian, all right? And I nailed it onto the wall. It's like, oh, Peter took this from the Lycians and all that. But then let's say, like, 30 years later we became allies with the Lycians and fought somebody else, well, then all those pieces of armor would disappear and wouldn't be on the walls of the temple anymore. They'd be gone. Um, so it's like, oh, yeah, those are our friends now. We don't really like to brag about that one at the moment. So it's kind of like um, 
becoming allies with Japan after World War II so we can have a foothold against uh, the Russians in the Cold War, and so we forgave a lot of their war criminals. But that, my friends, is a different story. So thank you, Joe, for that excellent question, and um, for any of you who listened through that, thank you for enduring my tangent. Um, anyway, so yeah, so, oh, Lorenzo, status, wealth, glory. Um and strip the armor becomes a showpiece. Yeah, so there you go, basically. But I like the added thing with the, um, how they donate them to temples and you get your name out there and get more clout and then it would disappear otherwise. So there's that. Now, um, the shields, uh, at this time, shields are, uh, there's a, uh, there's a few different types of shields. Now, at, at this time, time in history there's not a ton we actually know about when it comes to what armor and weapons and a lot of other well let, we know some weapons but like what armor and shields and some things like that actually looked like we have some clue to it but this is a really long time ago like when most people think of ancient greece like classical greece and stuff this was their old history this was like classical greeks old history so they didn't have a lot of this stuff like when most people think about greek armor with like the hoplites helmets with a big horse plume and all that that was during like the iron age okay this is the bronze age so when homer was telling these stories he was like in the iron age when perhaps you'd might have more armor that you might more readily might more ready, readily recognize as being Greek armor. Um, if you look up what some of these other Greek armor sets and stuff looked like, or the Hittites and people of that nature, um, it's pretty different. You 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 hear things like you mentioned horse plumes and stuff like that, but um, a lot of what people actually were doing and wearing looks very diff looked very different than what a lot of people assume it does with Iliad. Um, so yeah, the but the shields um, mostly I think were meant for stopping spears from being prodded through them. Uh, like if you ever throw a spear, it doesn't always look like it has a lot of power behind it but if it's like a heavy spear that is a lot of kinetic energy and some people think bronze is really soft in relation to steel it's not as strong but bronze is not a metal to mess around with like i've worked with bronze before in metalworking and um it's like it's beautiful stuff First off, bronze is gorgeous. I really want to buy a bronze sword, but I'm, you know, being responsible right now. And um, that's a, uh, that's a, anyway. Um, but yeah, so, okay. So Joe, uh, thumbs up, very good. And uh, once again, Joe, thank you. Ah, oh, you're, my, you're my favorite audience member this episode. This is great. It's interesting to me because it seems that stripping a corpse in the middle of battle would make them vulnerable to attack. Well, it does. As we saw with Ajax, um, you know, trying to loot the body and then everybody else coming in on him. He, he wasn't able to get it. Sometimes you kill a guy and his buddies get him away. So, and they put up a big fight. Yes. Okay. Bubba the musician throwing five again. If you have anything constructive to add, I would appreciate it. Um, and Joe, the sink was fine for me too, but the first few minutes got cut off for some reason. Huh. Even though I was here before 730. That is strange. I wonder why that is. Well, I hope this episode hasn't had too many technical flubs in it. I hope that um, my accent for Diomedes was passable and um, that you enjoyed this episode 5 of an extremely bloody chapter in Homer's Iliad, book 5. Um, I say chapters sometimes by accident. They're divided into books, and I forget if I told you this before, but the reason why they're divided into books traditionally is because when the librarians at the, at the Library of Alexandria compiled the first standardized text of Iliad, yes, those people who I credit at the beginning of the show, uh, when they first did that, they um, were... Uh, da -da 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 -da, um, they had scrolls, which they called books, and so it was. It's we. It's believed that Iliad took up twenty-four scrolls, 
Um, and so that's why we say that Iliad has 24, not chapters, but books. So I think that's rather nice. Going back to around 280 BC, still many hundreds of years after the Trojan War. I think it's also interesting that we hear about Hercules in this, and we have Hercules' son, and Hercules apparently sacked Troy before in an age long past. So, um, yeah, it's a city that keeps getting destroyed, which uh, apparently matches up because at the archaeological site that we now believe is Troy, there have been several Troys, which also is very interesting. So, um, oh, FYI, I was in mirror image tonight. That's very strange. I wonder why. Well, evidently, this live thing has a few technical weirdities about it. That's my new word, trademark. And um, I'll be, I go back usually and watch the episodes after I've done them to see like how embarrassing it was for me to do different things. Uh, but anyway, I think that's us winding down now. So I hope that you haven't gotten too, um, you know, uh, full of gore yet because there is a lot left in this book. It was not all building up just to chapter five. We have got a lot more killing to do and a lot more grieving and tragedy and other things as well. So, um, I hope you enjoyed that. I think I'm done for tonight, unless we got, um, seems Bubba the musician might be trying to say something. Yes, no, maybe so. Well, anyway, um, yeah, that's been that. I just want to reiterate that, uh, this is translated by Stanley Lombardo and it's been put out by Hackett Publishing Company and I recommend this translation so much um, once again they aren't so like they yeah the views and all, the thing that says at the beginning <laughs> the views opinions expressed all that stuff but um, I highly recommend that uh, you get this translation um, if you're enjoying the story, because who knows, maybe when you read it aloud, uh, you'll find your own voices for these characters whose names are older than almost any others. So, uh, with that, I had another thing I wanted to show you tonight, but I seem to have unpreparedly left it under something somewhere, so I'm going to have to deal with that for you on Monday. Anyhow, so something else to look forward to. More blood, guts, announcements, things of that nature, and so on. And with that, have a wonderful night. Thanks for joining me. Cheerio!